Okay, so I'm going to focus on this guy right here, but also talk over to you folks who were kind enough to come in. All right, so my name is Jason Scott. I am a archivist and filmmaker. I do lots of different side projects. I'm a public speaker. I'm very comfortable, obviously, just going off for hours. In fact, it's stopping me. That's the problem. Um, so I work for a place called the Internet Archive, but I'll get back to that. Uh, I'm here in Vienna on an artists in residence situation, a program where there are people who are sculptors, people who are painters, people who are filmmakers, and then me. And uh, they brought me in and then didn't tell me what I should be doing, so I'm archiving. But uh, monochrome, monochrome brought me in. Uh, Monochrome is uh, over in the museum quarter. They've been around for about 25 years. They do pranks and films and weirdness. And I've known some of them for years. And they were like, you ought to consider this program. And I said, OK, that sounds kind of fun. So um, here I am. And I'm here for the month. And I've been taking photographs and helping Monochrome, who are now edging up into their 30th year of existence to think about something that a lot of organizations don't, which is the long-term footprint and representation of everything they were. And so I've been working with them to get their digital archives in one place and rearranging what's in their office and taking photos of these folks and, and everything else. Um, so uh, very quickly, my realm to becoming an archivist was very lumpy and weird and strange. So when I started out in, um, sometimes when I want to really go for the full Gilgamesh epic of my life, I'll say that my parents were divorced. It was a contentious divorce. I was abducted. And part of that meant that I was very sensitive to the fact that everything is undependable, that there's no foundationals to anything, a real, a real sense of, um, you know, disjointed uh, 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 connection to the world, that anything could change. No, these walls can be knocked down, this building can be closed, this city can disappear. So one of the results of that is that when I went into the digital world of computer dial-up bulletin board systems in the 1980s in, in America, I was extremely, um, uh, ready to understand that this was all transient, that this was a fun hobby being done by people. And even though it had airs of being a whole new world and fantastic and wonderful, that in fact, it was destined for disappearance and loss. So when I was using it, I was copying everything I found, figuring if I didn't do it, nobody would do it. By the time I got up to my 20s and I was on the internet, I had in my collections hundreds of floppies and pieces of, of the BBS era, as I called it. And in my late 20s on the internet in 1997, I thought, wow, um, I can't wait to go find out the big websites of how the internet used to be, how the BBSs were, and of course found nothing. And then I was like, well, I guess I better do it. So I went and got all my disks. I registered a site called textfiles.com and I put up a big collection of these old text files with no regard to their content. I mean, they were all over the place. There was no, it was, there was a few basic um, uh, organizations in terms of how I did my, uh, you know, phone freaking, hacking, bombs, uh, fiction, stories, something, you know, it was like whatever a 15 year old classified and put it all up on there and it became a big hit because there wasn't anything else like it. Um, I had gone to college not for archiving. I didn't recognize myself as an archivist. I had gone for film and performing arts. So I was a performer. I was a radio person, a television, newspaper, cartooning, animation, comedy. You know, I was a outgoing extrovert. When I did, no, <laughs> when I did textfiles.com, that put me in a weird position because now people thought of me as a historian, as somebody who was going to be the gatherer of things and the person that they could bring their stories to. So at the beginning of 2000, I realized, oh, I have all of these computer bulletin board stories. I should try to make a list of all the ones there ever were. Why not? They, only, they all have unique phone numbers. 
And in doing that, I unnecessarily or unexpectedly set up a honeypot for all of these people who were looking up their names on the internet, the name would show up, the name of their old bulletin board they ran 20 years ago would show up, and even history about them because it would use the lists to figure out how long and it was always funny to me because the first edition had 60,000 boards it's now like 180,000 and they would show up and correct me like they would say like oh you list me as existing from 1983 to 1989 it was 1983 to 1990 and I'm just trying to imagine that they thought that I was like at a desk with like piles like oh I forgot to get the 1990 book out sir I'm so sorry but it was that like expectation of like, oh, now I can finally tell my story, which meant that I suddenly had people who were writing to me and saying, um, oh, somebody understands. Here's nine unsolicited paragraphs about my personal history with these computers. And at that point, I could have just I put them into the comments underneath their entries and that was fun. But then it suddenly occurred to me like, wow, there's all of this human history buried in these machines that I was part of. I went to film school. Maybe I should do a documentary on them. And so I spent four years doing that, um, using my day job money to do it and produce something called BBS the documentary. And that was eight episodes. It was like seven hours in total. It was just this massive material. It had 200 plus interviews, it was a unstoppable juggernaut. And it was important for me because I had spent so much of my 20s kind of disconnected from people. And now I was walking into the homes of folks I would have never met all over the United States and um, Canada and like meeting them. And so um, the movie came out, it was a big hit. And then I said, what else do I wanna do? And then two things happened. Number one, I started to work on a second documentary, which turns out you knew about, called Git Lamp, which was about text adventures and video games that were text only. And the other thing that happened was I became much more of a, a pundit talking about computer and technology history and realizing the gaps in what was important because a lot of history, especially history about um, bought and sold things become corporate histories. They tend to say, this company came along, and then this happened, and this company came along, and they fought, now there's only one company. And I knew that it was more about families and interactions of social groups that were causing innovation or no innovation, or becoming part of the basic fabric of a community, and then echoes of that showing up for decades afterwards. So I suddenly found myself in that position of being handed old things and old items because people would say, do you want it? And then I um, also found co-founded an activist archivist group called Archive Team. And Archive Team had been basically a reaction to the closure of a couple major sites and realizing that there was no advocate for all of these human made stories and that they were being treated like products that were going out of business instead of actual you know repositories of knowledge so groups of us were trying very much to like by hand and then ultimately automatedly going in and pulling all these things down so we were doing that and it was nice. Um, and then two things happened. I got divorced and I got laid off. So um, the, uh, the result of that was that I suddenly found that I didn't have to be working in the relatively boring job I was doing that was not archiving. So I asked for people to support me for a little while. I finished GitLamp, put that out, and then started looking for a place to work. And so that's how I ended up in the orbit of the Internet Archive in California. Now, for some people, they think I've always worked at the Internet Archive. It was such a good match that people assume I either started it or I was aware of it for years before and I wasn't. Um, I was just looking around for institutions or places I could work at that would 
do this kind of work where I could take uh, an old movie and do inquiries on its technological stories and where are these coming from or any other thing that interests me. And ultimately, I literally went to an event at the Internet Archive and then just literally told the founder and other people that they should hire me. And I don't know how that would work in other situations, but for me, it worked. So I just would literally, I gave a big, huge speech at the event. Then I just kept going to people and going, hi, you should hire me. You should hire me. You should hire me. Until finally Brewster, the, uh, the founder, co-founder of Internet Archive said, well, I guess we're hiring you. And um, so I started work there in 2011. Um, by the first couple of years, I was 8% of all the data that had been uploaded. But now I'm less because I brought in other people. But it was an incredibly good match. It's very, it's a wonderful match. Um, they asked me what my uh, title should be, and I chose free range archivist, mostly because I didn't want to be nailed down as being just one type of worker. I wanted it that whatever caught my interest, whatever was, I think, important, I would focus on. And over the years, that has led to some very odd, very weird sets of collections. Oh, look at them all coming in. Parents got divorced and now I'm an archivist. Anyway, so little, 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 um, little domino is parents get divorced, archivist. Anyway, so um, the, uh, the, the, the projects that I've been involved with at the Internet Archive, which is at archive.org, um, have ranged wildly, but for the folks who maybe don't know the Internet Archive or don't know they don't know the Internet Archive, I'll just say it's at archive.org. To a lot of people, it's known as the Wayback Machine because that's its most killer product. That's where a guy co-founded a business back in the early 90s and the business in the back was essentially, um, I, I use the phrase Nielsen ratings for websites, but that's not going to fly in Europe. Um, it was a website where you would be able to, for a fee or for relative amounts, go to it and go, I run whatever.com. And it would go, wow, you are the 453rd most popular website for sports. You've been running the following servers over the years. Um, here's your average audience. And so those analytics were big, a big deal back in 94, 95. So he sold the company to Amazon for $200 million in Amazon stock in 1997. So now he doesn't have to worry about paying for his meals. And his first thought was, oh boy, now I get to be a librarian. So he set off on this mission. And the first mission was collecting sets of data. One of the sets of data was it turned out this website of his, which has been called, which was Alexa Internet, in case that name sounds familiar, um, was collecting snapshots of websites. And he asked them to keep copies of the snapshots for him. So after about five or six years, they had snapshots of thousands and thousands of variations of thousands and thousands of websites. And they created what we think of as the Wayback Machine in its initial form. And it turns out it's the killer app. Uh, we get 2 million visitors a day. Half of those are the Wayback Machine. People verifying things, people looking at old versions, being able to look back over 20 years at websites. Hugely popular app. And people have been enjoying that. But he wanted to go a little bit farther. And if, it's, and, and if the following examples of projects sounds randomized, social, and odd, yes, that is exactly what's going on here. He had some folks who were live music tapers, and they were like, we have all of these recordings of the Grateful Dead, but we don't know where to host them. And he said, we'll host them. And that's how the Internet Archive got into audio. Uh, a person named Rick Prellinger, created a collection that he had of government films he had been collecting for 30 or 40 years. 
um, he was like, where would I put these things if I digitized them? And Brewster said, I've got a place. Suddenly we have movies. Um, then he decided he wanted to scan one of every book. That's how we got into texts. And this went on for a while. And a lot of this I know simply because history fascinates me. So I started plumbing into the history of the Internet Archive as much as I had done bulletin boards or text adventures. What it was clear was that what made the place special, besides Brewster's money taking away a lot of the um, stress on the nonprofit, was an openness to trying odd things to see if it might work. And um, I also figured out that if it didn't cost us too much money, like if we weren't spending speculative dollars to do something, but if somebody was sitting on top of a hard drive, and this is how it goes to this day, I'll bump into somebody, they've been keeping something for five years, and they're like, I don't know what to do. It's 14 gigabytes of data. I have nowhere to host it. I'm like, I've got your problem solved. And I just host it for them. Um, and people who have their own personal obsessions or who want to cover something comprehensively will find themselves with a good home there. Um, so when Brewster hired me, he had some ideas of things I could do. So like I said, first I just started collecting things. But one of the ones was that he felt that we had really fallen behind on computer software. We'd done movies and music and books, but we weren't, and web, but we weren't doing software to that level. So I started downloading and grabbing terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of software. But he also pointed out something about the archive. And again, it helps to have been to the archive or to be looking at a functioning laptop that has the archive on it. But one of the real nice moves of the Internet Archive is the interactor, interactive aspect to our holdings. So it's not just that you can like know that we have this song, but that there's a player and the player will play the song or there's a book and you click on a button and you can read the book. Now, some people will not like the interfaces to which they should download them and put them into superior interfaces. But it causes a relationship to the equipment and the materials that have been brought in where you're able to move through them and just go, oh, I don't want that one. I don't want that one. And you can like relay them out so that's all the pages and you're like, no, nah, this isn't the one I want. Um, and, you know, uh, we could do that with all these other formats, but we couldn't do it with software. So Brewster said, it would be great, Jason, if you could um, make it so we could play software in the browser. Um, and I was like, that would be great. That would be really great. I just don't know how you would do that. And there turns out there'd be two different ways to do it. There's the easy way and the hard way. And I chose the hard way because the easy way is limited. The easy way, and there is now a product out there called easy, actually which is making great inroads, I might add, with people. And I have nothing bad to say about them. I, I enjoy watching them go. They know about me. I know about them. Only once was I put on a panel with them, and that wasn't awkward. Um, anyway, what, one way to do it is you have a bunch of remote servers somewhere playing the software, and then you connect to them through the browser. And I basically call that software TV. The advantage is being that you know fully the control. You know everything's going to work. Everything's great. You connect to it, you experience the program, uh, and then you go away. The problem is, is that that means you need machines for each person. And so as a result, you'll max out around 100 people at once because you're, you know, it's perfect, but it's, it's like stations, right? What I wanted to do was I wanted every single, inter every single individual browser to emulate the game inside the browser. Uh, so that only took about two and a half years and the brave lives of about five volunteers who I burned through making it work one after another. I really learned a lot about the limits of volunteers for that, but it ultimately happened. So there's a, there's a mechanism at the Internet Archive, which is also open called the emularity. And the emularity is basically a framework for running browsers, um, uh, have it with emulators such that we can emulate 
you know, thousands of platforms and we can do millions of games and programs and stuff at the archive. So if you go to the archive, you can actually like go to the, like the Amiga section or go to the Atari section, click a button and the game is playing. If your machine is slow, it will be slow. If your machine has a network issue, it will be slow to add it, but it'll work. And one fine, the, I don't want to, there's an entire talk in how we worked to make it that we didn't go to jail and how we approach this whole thing. But one of the things was we did things in phases and we knew different areas would trigger different responses. So first we did 10 unquestionably historical programs to see who would be furious. And the answer was nobody was furious. Then we did a bunch of um, consoles and only a small number of people were furious and we dealt with them. Then I put up straight up arcade video games and then 12 groups were furious. So at the end of the day, uh, everything is still up or most everything is still up with exceptions. And the previous fear that any attempt to make emulation work in the browser would be met with a, you know, blackened sky of lawyers that would rain down pain and subpoenas onto everybody are now yesterday's news, which is what I wanted. I wanted emulation to be boring. I want it to be as boring as being able to play music in the browser. That's where we are now. Um, but the week end we, um, the weekend that we uh, introduced arcade games for some reason. Three million people came at once to play video games and it cr just crushed the archive. It was a great day. But once we cleared out the bugs and figured out why the, it was getting, where the bottlenecks were, it could sustain a million people. So it worked out, it was great. And, and the ramifications of having emulation be in the browser has been very positive. Um, people have been able to use it for streaming. People have been able to do research. They've been able to look at old material and find all sorts of um, hidden, you know, gems that would otherwise be a pain to download to work in your browser. Plus, you can't share it. You know, if I say, wow, look at this hilarious thing that I was able to get running in my local machine. And to you, I can just say, go to this URL and now you take a look at it. It's great, it's powerful and it's fun. Um, somewhere around the edge, I'm, I'm still in the process of adding new platforms to the archive where we just added Palm Pilots. So now Palm Pilot software works. Um, previously, I think the last big one was Flash. Um, there was a group who was emulating Flash and we came to them and said, can we put it in our browser? They're really working hard on it. I mean, they've really done an amazing job. If you have Flash from before 2003, it'll run in the browser pretty nicely. After that, it might have some problems, but a lot of them run beautifully in the browser. Um, and so making the archive both a repository of what used to be, but also a living component for for access to these materials, to me is like the secret sauce of why this place has gone well. Now in the, that said, um, the archive faces a lot of interesting problems and a lot of weird things. And the name of this talk is things are getting interesting. And the reason I'm saying that is because I've had a real luxury. I get to wake up in the morning annoyed that I was asleep and not able to do my job. And I go to bed annoyed that I have to go to bed because I'm just really enjoying how every day is like an experience um, dealing with entities who contact us in a, in a stress or concern about how do we save this, um, providing guidance for people who are like, how am I going to make this work, um, giving people like a final story where somebody has assembled a bunch of physical materials and they say, I don't know where I'm going to put these and we're like, we'll take them. And Sometimes I have been a mere catalyst. I have had cases where group A is trying to get Institute B to take their material. 
and group B is dragging their feet. And so group A, you know, group A is able to go, well, Jason Scott of the Internet Archive says he'll take it. And literally the other group says, okay, well then we're taking it right now. So I've actually been that. I've been held as a cudgel, as a threat. Um, the archive has a couple storage facilities or physical archives around the countries, a couple countries, um, massive locations, some of them as large as a Walmart where there are millions and millions of books, thousands of movies. Uh, I have a shipping container full of software. Um, so it's like, it's not just the, the big irony for Brewster is he thought it was going to be all digital and it turns out to be physical anyway. Uh, so we have just massive every day we digitize another 3500 oh, there's the numbers you want. All right, every day we digitize about 3500 books we digitize a few hundred records we record or copy about 11,000 hours of radio we grab something like 114 satellite channels from around the world we make them all searchable. Um, we absorb about 75 terabytes of data a day. Uh, we are officially, I just got the numbers of what we're officially allowed to say. We have about 100 petabytes. We have, but I would rather say we have at least 100 petabytes. I don't know what they're doing back there, but we're taking in a lot of data and keeping that functional and working and everything else is, is, is just part of the, the, the difficulty of trying to, you know, also make everything available to an audience of millions every single day. So that's the real challenge. Um, as a random archivist, a free range archivist, the things that I have focused on over time. By the way, if somebody has a question in the chat, just throw it into the chat. I'll see it eventually. Um, over the years, the same play has happened. I show up and I'm archiving something and Brewster goes, wow, that's weird. Do you think we should be, you think we should be saving this? And I go, trust me, we should be saving it. And between three to five years later, people have nothing but accolades for Brewster's foresight and archiving this thing. We do this over and over again. So for instance, hip hop music mixtapes, just, I was like, these things are coming out. We should grab them. Boom, thousands and thousands of these mixtapes. And we're, we're one of the largest collections of that. Um, manga, it's other things that I've been grabbing that have been, like I would grab things besides the software, besides manuals for software. Although I will say manuals have been a big deal. We have about 3 million manuals. Um, magazines but also supermarket flyers from hungary or grabbing um what are some other really good ones like a lot of data sets a lot of cases where somebody puts a data set up and the data set is both useful as a correlation to the paper that it was for or the project but it actually kind of stands on its own as its own collection of data. So uh, a bunch of Twitter data sets, a bunch of music data sets, um, MySpace deleted all of their music um, in like 2011. Um, people have come to me with massive collections of music they downloaded from this place. Um, and then putting them up again. Um, probably the first big one was the Internet Underground Music Archive, where uh, uh, it was bought out in 2000, bought out again in 2006, shut down in 2008. It was 400 and, or maybe it was 275,000 music tracks deleted. And somebody had quietly downloaded them all and given them to me. We put them all back up again. And out of the tens of thousands of bands, I think, 13 were angry and they weren't even angry they were more just yeah well, no, don't don't make these no that was all they were very much like and they were interesting stories too like like i think my favorite was there were two bands and they had the same name and they were at each other's throats for years because neither would give up the name and the name is dumb it's like fire eagle it's just a dumb name 
And finally, one of the bands had broken up. And the other band was like, yeah. And then 10 years later, I put up all the old Fire Eagle stuff or whatever. And they were like, please, could you like not do that? But other times I had people where they were like, yeah, my family threw out all of my partners or her, his family threw out all of his music, my partner's music, and you guys brought it back. Or people who would be amazed that we had CD-ROMs that had material that they thought was lost forever. Um, there's a guy who worked on a video game when he was 13 for six months and gave it to one cousin as a joke and then forgot about it and lost it. And 25 years later, somebody live streamed playing it on Twitch. And his name went by and one of his friends contacted him and he was like, how are you playing this game? His cousin had uploaded it to one bulletin board system where it had been swept up in one CD-ROM and this one CD-ROM had been digitized and put on the archive and somebody was going through bad programs on this CD-ROM, including this guy. So like those kinds of rediscoveries, and, and bear in mind, I, I, I'm describing relatively light things. The archive is incredibly important for people doing genealogical work, doing government or city research. Um, we, we do all of that. You don't bring in seven or 10,000 items a day and not have some really you know, fundamental pieces. And in fact, for my boss, um, the uh the you know he his big initiative right now is he's calling it government's library where he's trying to ensure that a bunch of dangerously transient data does not end up gone you know whether data or government documents or evidence of things where to save money they're deleting it so 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 here it is it's 2022 one of the things that I do in the talks, in the, in the um, weekly meetings, the weekly all hands meetings, is I sound like a raving lunatic while I tell my coworkers about things that are coming. And then later, when we are all washed over with the thing, everybody is like, wow, it's more than you thought. So just for the purposes of this particular talk here, I'll mention where we are. Um, Let's see. One of the side effects of being able to gather as much data as we can and how many of these cultural pieces is that I have been running harder and harder into folks, but like the process is now relatively easy. It's just time consuming or uh, if you prefer bulky, which is like I can probably, I have a phone app. I can go through every book in the back of the shelf of this room and be able to tell you in about an hour and a half how many we have, you know, probably less, maybe 40 minutes, because I can just scan the barcodes and I can tell you if we have it, where it's located and so on. As a result, data that was never online in the, in the grand sense is coming online all the time, especially historical data. And a lot of people have not quite or are either black and white terrified about the ramifications of this world now they don't want any of this data as easily accessible as it is uh, or they would like to see some sort of control put on it that is odd for example uh, i stumbled backwards into putting up or helping put up many 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 tens of thousands of zines uh, especially from the 60s 70s 80s um, and on the whole, it's been great. It's great because many of the same issues being brought up by 1970s and 1980s radicals are now being brought up by 19, you know, 2020 and 2010 regular folks on Twitter. And being able to find citation of like, these are known, these aren't recent um, uh, mutations in how government works. It's like these are known problems that have existed always and there are ways that they have been processed and these are common excuses that have been given and clearly 25 years later, you know, there's actual education to be done in there. But then there's the philosophy that like a lot of these materials were never meant to be widely disseminated, that they were perceived as individual things that would be dropped in the openings of 75 coffee shops and then never thought of again after three weeks that they were disposable and ephemeral. 
And I've been like really struggling with having, you know, we have a takedown thing. We certainly have ways to protect it, but we do see that coming. And that has now mutated. Now there's a problem that I am dealing with, which I call the inside out problem, which is that now there are generations of people, especially under 25, who have never known a world that an all seeing internet that pervades all aspects of life in every single way has not always been here. That for them, it's about as equivalent to them as the phone company was for me in my early years or a, uh, or government. And it's just a perception of this thing. And people joke about it or they reference it or they're furious about it, but it's like, it's always been there. It's, 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 it's a place. And, in the realm of that place, I see some of them believing that there are variations of privacy and personal space within the realm. So, so if you're somebody who like remembers when there was woods and now there's a mall, there's a generation that now lives in the mall who thinks there's private places in the mall that they can sit. And if you're from the woods era, you're like, you're in a mall, but it's not like that for them. They are a fish in a bowl and they only see the water. They don't know where the bowl is. And watching that has been very interesting because they're now expecting ephemerality and control over their ephemerality in a realm that is designed for anything but ephemerality. And in fact, has a second underlying layer of evaluation quantification and analytics on top of the non ephemeral research data. So a person is like, you shouldn't be able to tell what I said to my girlfriend last night. And it's like, well, we can actually tell which syllables you use the most when you talk to your girlfriend, we, we can tell what products you've mentioned with her, we know how often you two talk, we also know when you hang out in the same physical space and what those days are, and therefore your sleep schedule, like that culture clash of people who are born inside of this egg is is going to get worse. And I think it's going to probably work out to legislation, but it might just work out to a constant unending tension, which I encourage. I mean, I'm not like and they should sit down and shut up. I'm like, no, every single generation should ask fundamentally what was going on five years before they were born and what the heck happened and why is it now? But as an archivist, which is dedicated to trying to preserve and which you constantly visualize the world as a constantly fading, constantly disappearing thing that only your vital effort will save, it can be very jarring or difficult to be like, save everything, except that, let that burn. So I'm dealing with that. The other big one I'm dealing with right now is synthetic media. Um, I I came out against cryptocurrency like years and years ago, which put me at odds with a bunch of people who were getting rich off it, which is fine. My reasoning would is 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 not necessary for this talk. I just did. I, there was a lot of reasons I didn't like it. A lot of reasons I still don't like it. Um, but it can be summarized as I dislike the financialization of everything. I do not like it that everything is turned into a gains and loss market. So uh, it's like a side bet on life. You know, it's like sitting in a coffee house, watching an old man walking and laying odds as to whether or not he'll trip and fall in a puddle, as opposed to making the sidewalk safe, because now you have an incentive to make an unsafe sidewalk for the next betting round, right? Like it just, it just warps everything around it. And when you're dealing with anything involving finances, it just can do that. So for me, I had a big issue with cryptocurrency. Now come up to AI art, synthetic media and everything else. And I'm like, woohoo, this is the greatest thing ever. I'm having a fun time. And I'm watching as the same people or different people who are having trouble with it are dealing with it. And personally, I am a huge fan of just punching AI in the crib constantly. Like this is a really great time to do that. We, we gave browsers, you know, Tim Berners-Lee makes a slightly better version of already extant browsers that has a slight more graphical aspect to it. And we all went, 
cool, let's see where this leads, gave it lots of oxygen, and democracy almost falls. I'd love to be able to say with AI, instead of going, well, let's see where this leads, I'm all for like, maybe, I don't know, pass anti-murder bot legislation, you know, just like do a couple things, make it a little difficult, because we've proven it works, we've proven it's fun, it's great, it's interesting and also weird and okay but like don't take it at face value let's not fall for that again in the meantime i'm having a great time because i come from a family of artists so for me doing art has been very fun i'm able to like recreate watercolors and you know design fun things and also have fun with these text-based ones and everything else but on the archivist side it's very interesting because people well <laughs> I had to deal with somebody who had a near nervous breakdown because he had worked himself up into a panic about AI or, okay, so people use AI, the term AI, I hate the term AI, I get it. I use either synthetic media or aggressive, what was it, uh, algorithmic intensity. That was my other term. <laughs> so, so algorithmic intensity run against things that are doing this, right? And the archive has a limited amount of space and it has now been proven that a relatively driven individual using AI can generate hundreds of times more content to be archived than a regular individual hand making or semi hand making something. So there's a danger in art communities that you have people who are dropping, you know, 300 drawings a week in a world that was designed for a person to drop four and it's warping everything plus it tends to have very straightforward styles. Now, I don't, as somebody who literally was there when Aldous was bought by Adobe and, and, and page maker, you know, became the, you know, the, the Adobe page maker and eventually Adobe's other products. I totally understand the use of computers as tools. And I understand the whole process of having these things play a part in your life. So for me, I'm like, I get it. But I also realize that right now, what caused that guy's nervous breakdown was a sudden realization that the forgery and convincing artificiality of false narratives could now be done in the home. You know, that it was essentially, we, we could do it before, but now anyone can do it. Anybody with a GPU can do it. I happen to think that most, having worked in a, 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 I had somebody really flip out about this at me, and I tried to tell them the story of how intense the world of Nintendo prototype ROM markets are, and have been for about 15 years, where thousands of dollars can be made if you can show a never released Nintendo game, and since it's a, you know, six, not 16, uh, 64 to, you know, two megabyte cartridge, how relatively that easy that is to forge using other code and other programs. Um, and the steps that were taken within those communities to ensure that somebody wasn't trying to do a fast rug pull on a fake one. It made everything a little more annoying and it made things a little more less, a little more untrusted, but they, they handled it like because it turns out that something like a ROM can't be created in a vacuum. Like if there's no other documentation, no other reference, no other name, there's no programmer, like it, if it just rises out of the darkness with a $55,000 price tag and no provenance, people are gonna call it, right? And, and, and I believe strongly that like synthetic historical material, you gotta go? No, it's no problem. So, um, I think that like synthetic historical material um, is going to always be a problem. We had a situation about four years ago at the Internet Archive where somebody in a Wikipedia battle, one of the greatest battles you could ever have is a Wikipedia battle, tried to win it by citing a page in a book 
but the book that he was citing was a book he had uploaded to the Internet Archive and changed the text of from 1845 or whatever. So he he was dedicated to winning this citation. But the fact that he was caught um, at least gives some hope. But this is a problem that has existed, you know, for some time. And I think there's going to be great advances and work done in digital signing. I, I don't, I'm not going to say blockchain. Blockchain has attributes of this, of permanent record, but so does cross hash checking, which has existed now for many, many years. The archive does what's called a fixity check on every piece of data in its control once every seven days. So the data is in at least two, probably three or four drives. Those drives have hash checks. The hash checks are checked against the files. If anything goes weird, anything, an immediate rescue operation kicks in, an automatic logging. And it doesn't happen often, but it does happen, where just every once in a while, a hard drive just kind of gets a little weird and sick and one bit goes weird and it's going to look like a slightly darker pixel on an image or look like a slightly different image on a scan but our system notices that hash and then begins to initiate repairs all the time it is a constant problem that exists no matter what but we've been trying you know we've been doing it for 25 years it's not a new thing it's when people portray these old these these new situations as being unknown by the human race for any time. And I'm like, well, they used to have wax seals with strings in them, uh, the same problem. So as the days are going by at the archive, and as, as I'm working on the things that come by, my average day is answering a lot of questions about how can we do this? How can we help you here? Being the bystander to a story that's going elsewhere, my father has all of these old scans Will you, you know, items, I want to scan them, can you hold them? Or to answer speculative questions from people about what's the archive going to do about this, and to the various amount of freedom I have to answer, I will answer. But also it's just a general excitement that um, every day people who are just citizens upload to the archive, just people. They just have a pile of data. They think the data needs to go somewhere. They think of the archive. They upload to the archive. They do a mediocre job of describing it, and it works. If, if it's a PDF, it gets viewable. If it's an audio file, it gets playable. Maybe it's a recording of their band when they were 14. Maybe it's a recording of a speech they attended. Maybe it's just a bunch of files taken from somewhere else uh, out of a sense of do-gooderism that wastes our space. But I get what they're trying to do. You know, if you need. If you need 100,000 hours of streamers playing video games, we're your home. Um, just people who have just said, we can't let this go away. We have to rescue this. Uh, that sense that in, even though I can sometimes make fun of where they choose to put their effort, that inherent human spirit, that story, that idea that a person wants to rescue what used to be there was what drove me from the time when I was young. And so I see it every day. I see it reflected in the young. I see it reflected in around the world. And I'm, I'm very much proud to be part of it. All right, so are there any questions? Any questions online? How can you talk that much without breathing? Is there? Well, you got a question. Hello. Sorry, I didn't see you on the big screen. Archiving and capturing. How do you feel about how do you feel about ever being able to capture everything? Because I was thinking about the number of books being printed. Was you said the number of books being archived every day. Sure. How do you feel about that? Like how does that? Well, I, well, I, I think that. <laughs> so I think in the same way that you can be a vet that saves a lot of animals, but realizes you're going to have to put animals down as a form of it, is just like a realization that. Uh, taking on an impossible task and not treating it as a binary goal that has to be filled right like some you know like if you decide your success is this one particular brand of car a certain kind of mate and living in a very specific location 
because that's what you thought between, until you were 21, right? I'm going to have a Porsche, I'm going to marry this kind of person, and we are going to live in Shoreditch. We're going to live in Upper West Claw, because Upper West Claw is where the family is always at a... Yeah, I mean, then you have this incredibly brittle outlook that's a binary one or zero. For me, I look at the numbers I used to do, which was when I was a kid, it took me years to collect a couple hundred megabytes of text files, years. Um, on a given day now, I will grab multiple terabytes of data and put it up. And to be honest, um, a lot of my, a lot of things I started to do, a, a big side project I got involved in that, that enveloped me and is one of the other things I do is um, we were having a spam problem, having open uploads, people would upload spammy items. And it was taking a couple people a long time to fix them. So I started writing code to make it easier to detect, assess, and then put away spam. We don't, we don't delete the spam, but we put it away. And then I was like, well, I wrote all these tools to assess large amounts of material. And in fact, make decisions based on those materials. I should do that as well for regular things. So one of the reasons I'm very chill and sitting around here is because I know there's scripts right now that are moving literally thousands of items a day around the archive. Like they're like looking at it going, oh, I know you. You're uploaded by this person. And when they upload stuff with this attribute, it's this kind of a thing. So I'm going to stick you in the magazine section because this guy just uploads magazines. Um, the script is called You Had One Job, and uh, it, it, it goes ahead and runs, right? But there's other scripts that do things like, oh, uh, there's one called Album Potato, for reasons I don't even remember. And Album Potato looks at like the audio uploads of somebody and says, huh, they're uploading something with cover art and more than five tracks of music. I think this is an, uh, an album, and it'll go off and do it. So I've actually created my own level one uh, technical support team, but it's all mm -hmm. scripts. And so I feel that extensiveness of like knowing that like things are happening far beyond me. Um, a weird power flex for some people with me is I'm mostly retired from archive team. Like I, I really tried to make an activist group that would outlive me. I think a lot of activist groups make the mistake of having a cult of personality and then it all depends on that person. These folks run without me. There's a couple hundred of them. But there's only one last that occasionally I brought in to like be a hard ass for like a very specific fight. But that happens like once a year. It's not very often. It's just more like we are locked. We don't want to make this decision, Jason. But even there, I actually helped create a mechanism for a quorum to go like, and maybe you don't even need me, right? It's great. It's great. It's great, great, great feeling. Um, and, uh, and they've actually gone up against me, but on my Twitter feed for now, um, it helps if you played Bioshock, but the joke still works. Um, people will say to me like, oh, this website's going down. EAD.es is going down. And on my Twitter, I'll just go archive team. Would you kindly archive EAADES? And that's it. That's all I say. And I don't have to check. I don't have to do anything. I know they'll see it and they'll just quietly do all the archiving work and then put it up on the Internet Archive into a collection and I just walk away and people are like, wow, that's crazy. And I'm like, no, that's building a good team and depending on them and delegating. So the stress of I'll never be done is way obviated by having some time ago start to set. I mean, I'm 52 now. I don't want to be doing act active archiving on a personal basis after I'm 60. So I'm trying to focus on like, here's what I did and what I do and what I do approach. And if it turns out uh, nobody takes up that mantle, nobody was going to take up that mantle, no matter how ins insanely I burned myself out. I think that's it. It also helped to have a heart attack. So I had a heart attack when I was 46. And so I got like a spoiler preview um, of like what happened. And what was funny was, uh, funny, was, um, was I didn't, um, I was completely at ease on the operating table because I was like, oh, I'm famous for something that's not embarrassing. Uh, this team 
will just archive all my stuff. Like I know they'll just do stuff. Good stuff was done. I got some nice. That was a great run. And, and then I stuck around. And so I knew from that point on, like, I'm just like, eh, you know, buses are fast, trams are silent, planes are undependable sometimes. And I'm just gonna, you know, move on with my life and I'll just keep working on it, talk about the things, but I won't, I won't look at life as a series. I never will of a series of missed opportunities and lost failures. Cause all you do is you get more bitter you get more angry. People don't want to talk to you more. And it's just this vicious cycle. Nobody wants to talk to sad little, I didn't do the right thing in 1996, man, until he's gone. That's how I do it. So on a given day, so I did a, here's something for you. I'll do this. I don't, no questions from there. Okay. Um, I create, are you aware of the internet meme, big chungus? You're allowed to not know. That's the fat bugs bunny uh, based off an old thing. So I created a script about two months ago called Operation Big Chungus. And what it was, was I went through to the archive and I said, are there any unclassified, undescribed items at the archive that are more than a hundred gigabytes in size? And I ran it and I discovered 1.7 petabytes in like, the biggest file was eight terabytes. Many of them are like one. And it's, it's these extremely misguided clumps of data, but they've like never been looked at because they would have a name like file. And I'm like, okay, so Operation Big Chunk is just went in order. Here are the biggest files at the archive and here's where they are and everything else. So I've been stepping through that. And I have been discovering some of the most brilliant, misguided, massive collections of data that I didn't even know were there. Where like somebody is like, here's five years of American wrestling, right? Just, they just thought they needed to put all American wrestling shows into one fat uh, item on the archive and call it raw. <laughs> And I was like, okay, okay. Uh, and, 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 there's, and there's one that's like, and there is one that's my personal favorite and I, I can't get rid of it. Um, so if you, I mean, you know, when you deal with like people and a person has a personal hard drive, an SSD or whatever, and that personal item has um, uh, um, all their detritus, like all the things they thought were cool. Oh, episodes of things or books, survivalist prepper junk or weird things they want, Harry Potter, whatever, you know, just images, models and whatever. Every once in a while, someone uploads one of those. It's just like somebody's junk drawer, right? And we generally make them unaccessible because they're just so unpredictable, they're just a mess. But I found one. And it was called don't tell anybody <laughs> and its description just said now don't link to this the description I'm, I'm being very clear the description on the item was don't link to this and do not share this around and we can have this for a pretty long time and we can all have a good time with this and just leave it be that was the description and i was like it was the kids who live in the mall again for me. They had like literally figured out that like they could like put their little packet like behind the shelf in the school in one part of the library. And I was like, well, I'm, I would have done that. So I put it away into like the low metadata section, which I've created, which is just low metadata items that are whatever. Maybe somebody else in the team will dark it. But for me, that was a personal. So it's, it's hard for me to get stressed when like every day is a fun adventure. I think if I felt that I was doing something I hated and then realized that I was only hitting 80 out of 100 of the mark, but I'm hitting 100 out of the mark. I'm hitting like 300 out of 100 for unexpected, delightful surprises in any given week. So that's kind of where I go. That was a very long answer, but I, I just noticed nobody else was, was, was going in there. But I'm a very, you know, I'm either a, a good, I'm either a advertisement for doing the job you love, or I'm nuts.
Of course. Yeah, no problem. You can, if you guys have been, I'm, I'm text files on Twitter, and you can find my other stuff at the top if you have any questions or follow ups, or if there's anything I've mentioned. Same for everyone here. Um, is you can just always message, message me to go, you mentioned this. How do I get to that? That's my job. Thank you. No problem. Before you ask the question, let me just find out what this person. Yeah. It seems that new media is getting larger and more rich and would therefore need more hard disk space. How can the archive scale to capture the increasing items? And the answer is with great difficulty and with increased and median cost. Um, right now we are seeing a case that people are generate like the most noxious level of, of uh, data growth is in video. Um, we have now created an entire subclass of person who sits in front of a never ending running video camera who is just going off living their lives and recording every moment and some of them are very talented at it and give a very uh engaging experience because you're not really it's like going to a bar you're not really just drinking alcohol you're listening to the wisdom of a guy who 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 has learned more mistakes who's forgotten more mistakes than you have learned life and that's fantastic it was never about the alcohol it's about what was being said but a lot of times in streaming especially uh, it's just endless data so we have taken the attitude where we are basically fine with a representative amount of it but we will reach out to people and kind of take them aside and be like buddy buddy you've uploaded 45,000 five-hour videos we're set can you not do as much it'd be really cool like it's fine and and sometimes it'll be like well but what about abc and they start to come up with ponderables like what if there's a person who's uploading war crime footage and you want to, you know, record that for later? And it's like, OK, let's talk about it. And or why don't you keep a copy if it's already accessible elsewhere? And then if it, um, you know, disappears, be the hero and pull it out. And, you know, we've had that happen. And, and sometimes there's some resistance to that because then now it's a personal cost. But we're always struggling but when it comes to like literally when it comes to text audio um uh software to some extent it's actually pretty good it's actually not that hard you know i think our average hard drive space right now is 18 terabyte drives we have um a couple petabytes of disk space open um and i have a bunch of scripts that i've written to kind of log like what's coming in? Like what's coming in? What's going on? What's the big amount? Who, what's the most amount? Who's big? What are they doing? And the answer is, except for speculative streaming, we hold it down pretty well. Um, I think that every once in a while, someone will come to us with a multi terabyte data set and say, do you want this? And we might say yes. And you know, usage will grab up that day. Uh, we will definitely talk to people if they believe they have a physical collection, but there have been such great advances in compression, in storage. Um, we haven't moved to deduplication yet, but maybe some point we will do that. Um, so right now, right now, I'd say things are holding together, but it's it's definitely something we can't just sleep on and walk away from. What was your question? Uh, so first of all, I'm now wondering whether we should like you know put the video up to the archive as well, and not just to your Do put the archive. I, I assumed you were going to. If you Maybe don't, you if you don't, one of my fans will. I guarantee that. Um, but like more, and this is probably a very boring, <laughs> boring question. I like um, boring questions. I give interesting answers to boring questions. Uh, um, because it's very technical, but you speak a lot about access, and so I um, do a lot of work um, with uh, together with uh, different um, disabled people. So I'm wondering whether there is any kind of like drive or how that looks like to to also make media that is not necessarily accessible in one modality accessible to that modality. So one thing that we definitely got started on, and it's a step. 
is um, now understand that the AI companies are releasing really powerful tools basically for free because they're afraid people are going to panic about AI. Like, so in other words, if you create a new, I don't know, a new thing that does this fundamental change, that this, uh, every metaphor I'm gonna come up with is stupid. So I'm gonna stick with AI, how about that? So instead of just quietly doing really good transcription, put it out for free and let people use it and let them know it's just, it's just software, it's just code. So OpenAI released Whisper, and Whisper was a particularly powerful translator and transcriber, and it's really good. It, it like uses a lot of trickery and techniques to be able to do um, punctuation and spelling and so on in different languages, and it's very popular um, for people messing with it. So I was one of the people who thought this was amazing because... The archive is sitting on thousands and thousands of hours of VHS tapes and videos and radio. And, and we had a deal with a couple transcription companies, but they were like limited. They were like, you can really do only like two or three streams at once. And it can only be this fast. And this enabled us to do reasonably good transcription. And I started aiming it towards what I call what I called the crap. And what I meant by the crap was stuff where we couldn't perceive its direct full societal value yet. Recordings in the backs of um, nightclubs of people talking or commercials for like really boring things and so on where we did not know what we were gonna do with it. But we have it, like people putting up VHS tapes and running it against it. And we've been doing it now for about a month and a half. And so we're about to make them searchable. So in theory, you'll be able to say, search all the captions for this phrase, have it show up. Now suddenly a recording of an Australian daytime talk show from 1984 that has been sitting on the archive for three um, uh, years turns out to have meaning because it has a Barbie doll commercial proving a model that people thought never left the United States for a group of people. It'll solve arguments or being able to find evidence of I want to know what, you know, how this particular car was made, you know, marketed throughout its life. I can now look it all up. So in that way, I would love to see more of that. I would love to see more object recognition, right? To be able to say, I want to see, it was something, I want to see something where it's like a man and a woman are definitely on the screen and they are talking about the following subjects and I think it was filmed outside and I want to see evidence of how that's filmed, da 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 da. And having that ability to, 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 to have those kind of interactions and be able to come up with them. Plus, you know, with, you know, what's starting to feel, it's, it's definitely hundreds of thousands, but I'm fairly sure it's close to millions of hours of audio podcasts we're basically mirroring every podcast that gets published um being able to run those kind of analyses like being able to um with tv news we record all the tv news and in that particular case we're using the captioning but in that way we've been able to run trend lines we're able to see when a term it starts to be used by the news media watch its growth and then watch its decay and in like full descriptive and being able to say here's these terms and who uses it the most which you know news outlets have this push and for people who are doing analysis it's like incredible useful useful amounts of data a good example of like positive interaction with this data so you know i would uh, that being said i think that the archive website the actual archive.org website is a lot less accessible than it could be no what no not in america not the way it is because it's not a government site it doesn't have a government attribute to it no it is reasonable it is reasonably um accessible but it needs to be more accessible and i'm and 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 i actually got into a i got into a kerfuffle with a couple people because i'm i'm of the opinion that the, the archives mission is just so generalized it's really bad at doing something that's good for everyone and it should have accompanying sites aimed at different directions that it should have an audio based site or a kids based site. But 
people who apparently have been burned over and over again have very specific credos about that, that their belief is if you take a website and you cleave it down into multiple facets uh, presented in different subdomains, inevitably the subdomains will receive degraded status and uh, continue to suffer going forward. Like, it seems... like a meta filter. I mean, okay. Well, but like meta filter still, I mean, the answer is like the meta filter is a good proof of sub sites that are being maintained by the same software and pushed out in the same way and so on. So it just works that way, but it was designed from the ground up, but it also only does one thing. Yeah. It provides access to messages as opposed to audio, um, you know, movies, software and everything else. So if we make an accessible site, that the accessible site will suffer if any changes are made to the player or changes are made to the, you know. That being said, there's no reason for this thing to be, you know, that doesn't mean I'm going to toss it into the trash, but it does mean it's a bigger and more difficult problem. And um, I would love to see us get better at it, but like increasing access to the material is part of the mission. Partially why we do it digital, why we do so much digitization as opposed to just saying, come on down to Richmond, California, where the vast majority of our holdings are and walk through the crates and point to the crate you want. We'll pull it out of the crate, you know, like it, that was fundamentally kind of like what it's based on and what it's for. So that's kind of where um, that's kind of where we are, but it's it's. It is a first few steps towards what it what to me is functionally an intractable problem. Actually, speaking of which, uh, when I was talking about Whisper, so the assessment we made of Whisper is when it works, it scarily works, like it works beautifully. And when it gets it wrong, it scarily gets it wrong. Like super gets it wrong in a way where you're like, I don't, I don't know how you got this wrong. I'll give you a really good example. One of my tests was to run it against anime that had been fan subbed with a hard burn you can see the subtitles that the fan subber had done and i ran it both as transcription and as translation and the advantage of that was that i could see the translation and see the fan sub translation so i could go well how close is it it was fine it's pretty good you could see where the fan subber changed the language to impl implicate the person as being sarcastic mm stuff that may be lost culturally, like in the tone of voice. So even though the person says, sir, yes, sir, like even though it translates as sir, yes, sir, it's actually translated as sir, whatever, sir, yeah. because they're trying to do that work. So that work is lost. But in the beginning, it said translated by Hideki. And there was no words, no voice. And at the time I was like, oh, it must be, pulling something, maybe it heard a closed captioning, uh, what, what's, you know, must be a reason why it says translated by Hideki, and then a little later a person starts talking and it's fine. No, it's AI studied so much stuff like it, those are phrases that end up in the beginning of anime fan sub. It's like when a child in the modern era I said, it's exactly like when a child in the modern era, you record them dancing, and then they say to their parents, remember to like or subscribe, because they've watched so many videos that that's, what you, that's how you say goodbye in a video is remember to like and subscribe. It was just cargo culting its awareness of what's supposed to be in an anime fan sub. So that really, to me, strikes like the power and the danger of it, which is why I am definitely against unsupervised full connection of you know, full AI chain. I'm like, it's nice, but I call it like a really, really drunk intern. Like, great when it goes. And then once in a while, that intern goes way off the rails and just says a phrase from nowhere. And I'm like, mm, maybe it'll get, and I mean, it's pretty good now. And, you know, will it get better? Yeah, I think it will. So. You cannot put in things from the future, um, and so AI can also only draw from. Right, you can only draw from what was there.
<laughs> I want to answer a hand first because I like this one. Could it happen that funding of the archive runs out next year, slash anytime soon, and all material gets lost? Costs must increase yearly with HD. Um, it'll take a few years to kill us. Uh, it'll probably take five to 10 years of starvation to really knock the site out, at which point things would kick in towards storage. We've had institutions, maybe not the, our favorites like Google and so on, offer us disk space to say, we'll just take a copy of your thing if you want to store it with us. So we would definitely lean on a partner or something or ensure that pieces of the data get transferred out if we were in that kind of a death spiral. I will tell you that that's very unlikely. Um, the Kale Austin Foundation, the family that founded the Internet Archive and is one of its largest donors, this is what they're about. This is about every last penny uh, going to sustain, sustaining the archive. Um, that's all I can tell you in terms of that, but, you know, keep an eye out. <laughs> keep an eye out. What are some of your favorite artifacts that you've seen on the archive? Somebody uploaded a massive, almost complete collection of POG scans, milk cap scans, a couple thousand of them separated by year and content and date. That was hilarious. Somebody, uh, let me see, uh, a group of monks uploaded their daily chants at breakfast and lunch uh, every day for years and years and years before they converted it to a podcast of all things. Uh, in other sound news, there was a ornithological society in Toronto that was recording full 24 hour runs of bird song inside of parks, along with a secondary curated best of that would tell you like the 17 or 18 times that a you know a red-headed thrush you know did something at 2 p.m and this is you know that level of dedication i love the hungarian um uh, uh supermarket scan guy i love it when somebody works really hard to scan really obscure video games from like another country, a video game uh, magazine or, or things like that, where they do like incredible scans in Russian or Chinese or, or, or um, uh, uh, Czech, uh, you know, like to like really, really capture a sense of like this whole other area. I love when that happens. Um, one day I'll come to somebody if they're uploading hundreds of thousands of something. <laughs> And one day I noticed somebody was uploading hundreds of thousands of black and white scans of Chinese newspapers or what I thought were Chinese newspapers. And I contacted them and I was like, hey, stuff looks good, man. What, what, is, what, what is this? And it was a group of concerned archivists who realized that the Chinese takeover and crackdown of Hong Kong was going to cause them to delete thousands and thousands and thousands of records of Chinese and Japanese and East Asian newspapers, and they were duplicating it at the archive to the tune of about 300,000 issues. And so I just gave them tools to make it easier to sort them into collections. And yep, they did. They completely deleted them. They're only at the archive. And all of the finding aids, all of the guides, all of anybody in that area now knows, delete the part where you go to this Hong Kong institution and go to archive.org. I love that. That was just it fell into my lap. All I had to do was just give them a few tools to, you know, say this mag, you know, this news, this news, this news, because they had to recreate that. Lots of good stuff there, Ben. Every friggin' day, I will learn about something new. The biggest problem is writing good code for me and scripts for me to be able to track. Um, uh, uh, what's coming in and understanding. Uh, I have one called Hot Sheet where I'll go, somebody who normally doesn't upload just uploaded 800 things. Um, could you go look at them? So that's, uh, that's how it went. 
Any other questions from the fine, fine internet? Hello, Ladrina. I see you. Ladrina helped me. Um, I'm assuming that's the same Ladrina. Um, Ladrina helped me. Yeah, it is. Ladrina came and helped me unload 1,300 pounds of um, erotic science fiction fanzines out of the library of a 80 something woman who had gathered up three or four other people's libraries and was trying to see about getting it donated and every other institution was like great just give us an index and she was like i'm not going to index this i don't have the energy or the time but the archive was willing to take all of it without an index and we are working with a uh um we we're working with uh, a researcher out in California who is going to help get it indexed and get it scanned. They're going to families. You know, the big problem with fic I didn't talk about this during the main talk, but you know, fan fiction is a real thorny issue because people, for all of the fair use that they live on to be able to do transformative works of Harry Potter getting busy, they are abundantly protective of the distribution and, and availability of the fan fiction. So generally, I will not put fan fiction up because I'm like, you just get punched in the face. Just people are furious. Um, but this group is now reaching out to publishers and authors of fan fiction and one by one going, can we at least put this up in this fashion with this here and getting permission and doing that work and so they're going to be doing that for some time but ladrina helped me with it which is i still have the broken back i'll see a doctor when i'm back in in the u.s really whacked my i think i whacked my spine out of it was a lot of fan fiction they were very heavy very heavy Oh, I wish it'd be great. Um, in the room. Hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, talking about practical question. So, I, there's a site from an organization uh, that I used to access, and basically, the organization was they went away, and at some point, of course, the uh, website went away, and. I accessed it through the archive, um, and then somebody else took the uh, the domain. Yes, and then it disappeared. And then, yeah, they, they, they did the robots text and it disappeared. That is a known issue. So first, I'll let you know your stuff is not deleted. The that question has been one of those situations where internally I have been one of the voices that has been like, we should really make a solution. Even if it's a click through, even if it's a weird, you know, you're like, are you acknowledging that you're about to see something that is not related to the current owners and this is all, you know, something. And we just haven't done it yet. There are many, many, many changes to the archives interface and actions where they do it and people are like neat and a few of us will be like cool it's as cool as when we suggested it five years ago but i think it's because they try to be conservative and not get in people's faces they don't want it that a person grabs birdcage.com has a birdcage site up but you can go see the porn site that was there beforehand and i think that i understand what they're trying to do I'd love to see it mitigated more, more access, because the robots.txt thing, I get it. Now, bear in mind, I mean, there's a panoply of, of, of opinions. There are people who think there shouldn't be an Internet Archive at all. There are people who think you shouldn't be able to scrape sites. There's people who think that you should only be able to scrape sites with a handwritten letter written in ink and with a royal seal from each website that you're grabbing. I mean, you know, there's a lot of divergent opinions and we're sitting there trying, you know, we we just we started up because a millionaire thought it would be fun in the 1990s, and now we're persisting. Um, but yours is a really good concrete example of, yeah, 
I mean, it would be really good for us to have something that did a click through. Um, years ago, for example, we decided we weren't going to pay attention to robots.txt on .mil sites anymore or .gov sites, which are in, the, you know, in America and elsewhere, military and government sites, where we just said, these are tax funded things. They can't limit people from looking at them. So we just decided to ignore it. So we have made policy changes over the years, but I don't know where we're going to go with it. But I, I, I appreciate the, the frustration because it's annoying when a site is taken in and the new guys just knock it down. Any other questions in room or out? Well, this is this is this is this is like fun. This this whole arrangement. All right. Well, I think how long have I been here, Kana? I think I've been here. I think it's actually. Um...